Nothing has ever changed the world as quickly as the Internet has. Less than a decade ago, we went down to the Pentagon to do a story on something called information warfare, or cyber war, as some people called it then. It involved using computers and the Internet as weapons. Much of it was still theory, but we were told that before too long, it might be possible for a hacker with a computer to disable critical infrastructure in a major city and disrupt essential services, to steal millions of dollars from banks all over the world, to infiltrate defense systems, extort millions from public companies, and even sabotage our weapons systems. Today, it is not only possible, all of that has actually happened, plus a lot more we don't even know about. It's why President Obama has made cyber war defense a top national priority, and why, as we first reported in November, some people are already saying that the next big war is less likely to begin with a bang than a blackout. The story will continue in a moment. Can you imagine your life without electric power? When the president rolled out his... Until February 2009, retired Admiral Mike McConnell was the nation's top spy. As chief of national intelligence, he oversaw the Central Intelligence Agency, the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the National Security Agency. Few people know as much about cyber warfare and our dependency on the power grid and the computer networks that deliver our oil and gas, pump and purify our water, keep track of our money, and operate our transportation systems. If I were an attacker and I wanted to do strategic damage to the United States, I would either take uh, the cold of winter or the heat of summer. I probably would attack electric power on the U.S. East Coast maybe the West Coast, and attempt to cause a cascading effect. It, all of those things are, are in the art of the possible uh, from a sophisticated t attacker. Do you believe our adversaries have the, have the capability of bringing down a, a power grid? Uh, I do. Is the U.S. prepared for such an attack? No, the United States is not prepared for such an attack. It's now clear this cyber threat is one of the most serious economic and national security challenges we face as a nation. Four months after taking office, President Obama made those concerns part of our national defense policy, declaring the country's digital infrastructure a strategic asset and confirming that cyber warfare had moved beyond theory. We know that cyber intruders have probed our electrical grid and that in other countries, cyber attacks have plunged entire cities into darkness. President Obama didn't say which country had been plunged into darkness, but a half a dozen sources in the military, intelligence, and private security communities have told us the president was referring to Brazil. Several prominent intelligence sources confirmed that there were a series of cyber attacks in Brazil, one north of Rio de Janeiro in January of 2005 that affected three cities and tens of thousands of people, and another much larger event beginning on September 26, 2007. That one, in the state of Espirito Santo, affected more than three million people in dozens of cities over a two-day period, causing major disruptions. In Vitoria, the world's largest iron ore producer had seven plants knocked offline, costing the company $7 million. It is not clear who did it or what the motive was, but the people who do these sorts of things are no longer teenagers making mischief. They're now likely to be highly trained soldiers with the Chinese army, or part of an organized crime group in Russia, Europe, or the Americas. They can disrupt critical infrastructure, wipe databases. We know they can rob banks, so it's a much bigger and more serious threat. Jim Lewis is a director at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and he led a group that prepared a major report on cybersecurity for President Obama. What was it that made the government began to take this seriously. In 2007, we probably had our electronic Pearl Harbor. It was an espionage Pearl Harbor. Um, some unknown foreign power, and honestly we don't know who it is, broke into the Department of Defense, to the Department of State, the Department of Commerce, probably the Department of Energy, probably NASA. They broke into all of the high-tech agencies, all of the military agencies, and downloaded terabytes of information. A so terabytes? A terabyte is a, it's hard to say, the Library of Congress, which has millions of volumes, is about 12 terabytes. 
So we probably lost the equivalent of a Library of Congress worth of government information in 2007. All stolen by foreign countries. Yeah. Um, this was a serious attack, and that's really what made people wake up and say, hey, we've got to get a grip on this. But since then, there has been an even more serious breach of computer security, which Lewis called the most significant incident ever publicly acknowledged by the Pentagon. Last November, someone was able to get past the firewalls and encryption devices of one of the most sensitive U.S. military computer systems and stay inside for several days. This was the CENTCOM network, the command that's fighting our two wars, and some foreign power was able to get into their networks and sit there and see everything they did. What do you mean, sit there? They could see what the traffic was, they could read documents, they could interfere with things. Um, they were like, they were, it was like they were part of the American military command. Lewis believes it was done by foreign spies who left corrupted thumbnail drives or memory sticks lying around in places where U.S. military personnel were likely to pick them up. As soon as someone inserted one into a CENTCOM computer, a malicious code opened a back door for the foreign power to get into the system. So presumably nobody at the Pentagon is plugging in... They, they've banned them. <laughs> <laughs> My impression is most people understand that there is a threat out there. I don't think most people understand that there are incidents that are happening. You know, I've been trying to figure out why that is, and some of it is the previous administration didn't want to admit that they had been um, uh, rolled in 2007. There's a disincentive to tell people, hey, things are going badly. But it doesn't seem to be sinking in, and some of us call it the death of a thousand cuts. Every day, a little bit more of our intellectual property our innovative skills, our military technology is stolen by somebody. And it's like little drops. Eventually we'll drown, but every day we don't notice. Congress has noticed allocating $17 billion for a top secret national cybersecurity initiative. And the Department of Defense has nominated Lieutenant General Keith Alexander, head of the NSA, to run a new military command devoted to offensive and defensive cyber war. How much of this are we doing? We, meaning the United States. Uh, we're in the top of the league, you know. The, we're as good as... So whatever, whatever foreign countries are doing to the United States, the United States is doing to them. We are in the top of the league. Uh, we are really good. And if you talk to the Russians or the Chinese, they say, how can you complain about us when you do exactly the same thing? It's a fair point with one exception. We have more to steal. We have more to lose. We're the place that depends on the Internet. We've done the most to take advantage of it. We're the ones who've woven it into our economy and to our national security in ways that they haven't. So we are more vulnerable. Even the country's most powerful weapons are targets. So technicians at the Sandia National Laboratories make their own microchips for nuclear weapons and other sophisticated systems. This is a... Uh, Jim Gosler, uh, one of the fathers of cyber war, says most commercial chips are now made abroad, and there are concerns that someone overseas could tamper with them. So you're worried about somebody being able to get in and reprogram a nuclear weapon or get inside and put something in there that well, would make certainly, it... Well, certainly alter its functionality. Uh, what do you mean by alter its functionality? Such, such that when the, the weapon needed to, be, uh, uh, to go operational, uh, it wouldn't work. Have you found microchips that have been altered? We have found microelectronics and electronics embedded uh, in applications that they shouldn't be there. And it's very clear that a foreign intelligence service put them there. There are thousands of attempted attacks every single day, tens of thousands of attacks. Sean Henry's job is to police potential targets all over the United States. He is an assistant director of the FBI in charge of the Bureau's cyber division. He told us that criminals have used the Internet to steal more than $100 million from U.S. banks so far this year, and they did it without ever having to draw a gun or pass a note to a teller. The FBI became famous stopping bank robberies. Are there more bank robberies in terms of uh, the amount of money stolen on the Internet than there are guys walking into branches? Absolutely. With guns? Yes. Really? I've seen uh, attacks where there's been $10 million lost in one 24-hour period. If that had happened in a bank robbery where people walked in with guns blazing, that would have been headline news all over the world. And the bank probably didn't want it known. Certainly, uh, when there's a network breach, the owners of the network are not keen to have it known that their network was breached um, because of their concern that it might impact their business. The case Henry mentioned didn't involve just one bank, it involved 130, 
all of them victimized through an international network of ATMs, an international caper that required dozens of participants on three different continents. How did they do it? It was a sophisticated operation, clearly organized, where adversaries access the computer network, were able to gain information from multiple accounts, they were able to decrypt PIN numbers, and then taking that data, able to manufacture white plastic that enabled them access to get into ATM accounts. What's white plastic? Take a piece of plastic that's similar in size and shape and weight to an ATM card. They've got the card, they've got the PIN number, and they just drain the accounts. Almost $10 million in 24-hour period. What cities? 49 cities around the world. In Europe, in North America, South America, Asia, all over the world. Another case you have probably not heard anything about involves an extortion plot against the state of Virginia. Last year, a hacker got into a medical database and stole millions of patient prescription records and then followed it up with a ransom note. The note said, I have your, I can't say that word on television, stuff, we'll call it, in my possession right now. The hacker went on to write, I've made an encrypted backup and deleted the original. For $10 million, I will gladly send along the password. The state of Virginia says it was eventually able to restore the system, but the stolen information, including names, social security numbers, and prescriptions, can be used, sold, or exploited, according to the FBI. Did the Virginia Prescription Monitoring Program pay the $10 million? I can't discuss that. As serious as the electronic theft and extortion of hundreds of millions of dollars might seem, they pale in comparison to some of the other possible scenarios that are no longer outside the realm of possibility. They include an assault on the fiber optic networks that run the world's financial systems. Admiral McConnell, the former director of national intelligence, worries about the integrity of America's money supply. I know that people in the audience watching this are going to say, I mean, could somebody steal money out of my bank account? Or could somebody attack a bank that would wipe out my life savings? And the answer is, yes, that's possible, uh, but that's not the major problem. The more insidious issue is what happens when the attacker is not attempting to steal money, but to destroy the process that, that accounts for money. That's the real issue we have to worry about. To destroy the records. It's all record keeping. It's accountability of the wealth and the movement of that money through the system uh, that has to be reconciled at the speed of light. So if you, dis if you impact or contaminate the data or destroy the data, where you couldn't have reconciliation, you could have casta cascading impact in the banking system. Can you describe the consequences? If everybody goes down to take the money out, it's not there. So that's the issue. Since banking is based on confidence, what happens when you destroy confidence? One top U.S. intelligence official is on record saying that the Chinese have already aggressively infiltrated the computer networks of some U.S. banks and are operating inside U.S. electrical grids, mapping out our networks and presumably leaving behind malicious software that could be used to sabotage the system. Can a penetrator or a perpetrator leave behind yes. a, a penetrator. little things that will allow them to be there and watch and look yes. and listen? And Any successful penetration has the potential for leaving behind a capability. Do we believe that there are the governments have planted code in the uh, in the power grid. Steve, I would be shocked if it, if we we're in a situation where um, tools and capability and techniques have not been left in uh, U.S. computer and information systems. Of all the critical components of the U.S. infrastructure, the power grid is one of the most vulnerable to cyber attack. That's because the power grid is run and regulated by private utilities, which are unbeholden to government security decrees. I'll walk through the steps an attacker might take. Here at the Sandia National Laboratories, Department of Energy specialists like John Mulder try to hack into the computer systems of power and water companies and other sensitive targets in order to figure out the best way to sabotage them. It's all done with the company's permission in order to identify their vulnerabilities. And this is a graphic demonstration of how they could have destroyed an oil refinery by sending out code that caused a crucial component to overheat. The first thing you would do is turn it to manual control so that your automatic controls aren't protecting you. What would be your main oh, target uh, here? The heating element and the recirculator pump. If we could uh, malfunction both of those, we could cause an explosion. How would you do that? The first thing we had to do was uh, actually gain access to the network, and that's 
we've just got that as launch attack. And then we turn up the BTUs, and then we're turning off the recirculator pump. Uh, there we go. How realistic is this? It's very realistic. But the companies are under no obligation to fix the vulnerabilities, which was graphically demonstrated in a much more realistic fashion at the Idaho National Labs two years ago in a project called Aurora. A group of scientists and engineers at the Department of Energy facility wanted to see if they could physically blow up and permanently disable a 27-ton power generator using the Internet. If you can hack into that control system, you can instruct the machine to tear itself apart and that's what the Aurora test was. Then, if you've seen the video, it's kind of interesting because the machine starts to shudder, you know, it's clearly shaking, and smoke starts to come out. It, it destroys itself. And what would be the real world consequences of this? The big generators that we depend on for electrical power are uh, one, expensive, two, no longer made in the U.S., and three, um, require a lead time of three or four months to order them. So it's not like if we break one, we can go down to the hardware store and get a replacement. Um, if somebody really thought about this, they could knock a generator out, they could knock a power plant out for months. And that's the real consequence. This was the leap from theory to reality. When Congressman Jim Langevin, who chaired a subcommittee on cybersecurity, heard about it, he called representatives of the nation's electric utilities to Washington to find out what they were doing to fix the vulnerability. The committee was told that the problem was being addressed, but that turned out not to be the case. At a subsequent hearing seven months later, Langevin's committee members discovered that almost nothing had been done. What do you think we are, a bunch of jerks? They basically, they lied to Congress, and I was outraged. And they admitted lying to Congress. That's right. They admitted that they misled Congress, that they did not give accurate testimony, and they subsequently had to retract their testimony. Have they made any progress since you caught them out on this lie? No, not sufficiently. The private sector has different priorities than we do in, in providing security. Their, in a sense, bottom line is about uh, profits, and we need to change that. We need to change their motivation so that when we see a vulnerability like this, we can require them to fix it. Langevin and others have introduced legislation that would do just that. I look at this as like a pre-9-11 moment where we identify a problem, we identify a threat, we know it exists, we know it's real, and we don't move quickly enough to fix the problem. What I'm worried about is because of so many competing priorities, so many issues that we have to deal with, we, won't get not, we will not get focused on this problem until we have some catastrophic event. If the power grid was taken offline in the middle of winter, and it caused people to suffer and die, that would galvanize the nation. I hope we don't get there, but it's possible that we will.